This video was sponsored by Adam and Eve. Use the code in the description to get 50% off one item and free shipping in the US and Canada. Ugh. Hi everyone. This video is about gay. The word gay. And many other fun words that on the internet, especially here on YouTube, can sometimes be controversial to say. Such as trans, lesbian, penis, or perhaps redacted. I've been on the internet quite a while now, and I've noticed that while there are many things that the internet loves to talk about, there are few things we don't. Now, as I'm making this video, a couple of legislative bodies throughout Europe and the US, where most of my audience resides, are considering implementing a sort of legal framework. We're not really allowed to talk about controversial subjects. Subjects such as gay people. While some people decry this as an obvious attempt at silencing any voice that doesn't agree with you and a new wave of puritanism, others talk about it as protecting family values, protecting the sanctity of the family, making sure that we're age appropriate. A couple of months ago I made a video uh, that became rather successful about why we can't talk about drinks. And in that video, I primarily talk about drinks. But in this video, I want to talk about why we can't talk about anything. You don't need to watch that video to understand this one, but it's gonna have a similar vibe to it. <laughs> Much like in that video, there are many things that I want to talk about in this video that I simply can't say out loud. For fear that YouTube and the almighty algorithm is going to not censor me, but rather make sure that I don't reach as many people as I might otherwise have. And in that video, I had to use the word drink as a metaphor for the word redacted. Because YouTube doesn't like it when you use words like redacted. Something I found out when I made my first video about drinks, which YouTube age restricted and made sure that almost no one actually saw. This video is going to be even worse. And while this video is going to be about a lot of different things, it's primarily going to be about sex, drugs, and rock and roll. But before we go into all of that, let's talk about TikTok. There's something totally free you can do that gives you the same rush as ice cream. It's walking. No, no, I don't think so. I think you're, I don't, I know. Now, if you, like me, want to connect to the youths, you may have gotten the app TikTok. TikTok is like Vine, but worse. It has short videos that can feature anything from dancing, sing-alongs, uh, comedy, information bits, thirst traps, basically anything that you can think of. On TikTok, creators will talk about basically anything. Hank Green will talk about candle wax, I will talk about Magnus Schirschfeld, uh, and I will also post myself being very tall. People seem to like that. And generally, people are having a good time. But there's a specific language culture that has evolved only on TikTok. TikTok, like a lot of social media platforms, don't like it when creators use language that are contrary to corporate values. Things that advertisers might not like. This is a phenomenon you may be familiar with. This happens on YouTube as well, and in other platforms too. But on TikTok, ads work differently. Now, if you're watching this video on YouTube, odds are you're not gonna see any ads around me. I don't actually monetize my videos until like six months after they're out. But if you're watching it after that, you may see an ad here or there occasionally. And those ads are on my content. They're part of my video. What this means is that if you're clicking on my video, you have chosen to watch my video and those ads. And if I say something that maybe an advertiser doesn't like, they can simply not advertise on my video. But YouTube, oftentimes, can get away with at least treating my video as any other video on the platform, even if it might get demonetized. There are many different videos on the platform that can have ads instead. TikTok works differently. Most of the content that you see on TikTok comes from something called the For You page. The For You page is a curated box of content, basically, that you swipe through and every swipe contains a new video and you don't know what it's going to be. And whatever video is going to be up next is based on an algorithm 
on what you like. The algorithm analyzes everything that you do, such as how long you watch a video, how much you interact with video, things like that, and learns what type of content that you like. And in between those videos, that's where the ads are. Which means any individual creator can't be singled out from any other. If one creator says something bad, you can't just not advertise on that creator's video because there are no adverts on videos. If my videos have something that a corporation might not want to be on, that will taint the entire For You page. And so TikTok videos with language like that is better off being restricted. And how does it do this weird restriction, you might ask? Well, that algorithm that I mentioned, it also reads what you say and what you write in the video as form of text. So if you say words like Redacted. Redacted. It's not gonna like that. Those words, typically, are not something that advertisers want to be associated with. So, videos with those words are hidden away, not shown as much on people's For You page as they otherwise might be. This has led TikTokers who want to talk about those subjects, but still reach out to a large platform like other creators to invent a new type of language, which I call TikTok language. <laughs> I'm very creative. This has led to words such as unalive, in meaning of redacted or redacted redacted can become serotonin rock and the word lesbian has become le dollar bean <laughs> in essence what i was doing on my video on redacted replacing the word redacted the drink and various individual products with other words is something that people on tiktok have been doing organically now it doesn't block content using this type of word just as youtube rarely blocks all types of monetization on a video with spicy subjects it just suppresses it, shifts the balance a little bit where you can encourage a type of behavior. And that behavior is self-censorship. And this algorithm is more powerful than you might think. After just a couple of hours of using it initially, the algorithm figured out that the videos that I wanted to watch were about trans women, bisexual people, and had to do about history. Okay, that's me though. It's also recently begun to recommend me ADHD content and neurodivergent content, which I have to believe at this point that TikTok is reading my Twitter feed. Now obviously, every private corporation has a right to do this. This is not a free speech issue. We'll get back to that. And it's easy to see when talking about things like criminal acts, drug use, things like that. Those things, you know, maybe should be suppressed. But what about gay stuff? How about trans kids? What about rock and roll? But how does self-censorship even work? Most of our cultural understanding around censorship refers to top-down censorship. The man, typically the government, censoring the little guy. Which is often obvious and oftentimes seen as universally bad. Take for example a state banning the use of certain literature, clearly censorship or a state restricting certain topics from being discussed in public places or schools. This is pretty straightforward. Very legal restrictions with legal consequences for those who break the rules. And this could be for moral reasons, but also political or economic or whatever else. And it was very common in how society operated for most of human history, until freedom of speech and press laws became more commonplace, which Sweden caught first in the world in 1766, baby! Some legal censorship still remains, and for pretty good reason. Things like redacted hate speech and libel are typically subject to censorship, depending on your country's definition of free speech. But other than this, you can say pretty much whatever you want, in theory. Most censorship today doesn't work like that, and while it's easy to blame the internet for it, I think it's mostly advertiser culture. Take for example Elvis Presley and rock and roll. In the 1950s and 60s, it was perfectly legal for TV and radio stations to broadcast the music and videos by Elvis Presley, his sensual songs and his gyrating hips. But the genre of rock and roll was seen as very controversial, and a lot of stations risked a lot of money from advertisers by playing his music. But Elvis got away with it because he would bring ratings, the little scamp, 
But this wasn't the case for others who weren't superstars. A lot of musicians who performed the stale style of music that Elvis was were practically banned from performing their music in any meaningful way during the same time. In the 1950s, the FCC, who regulated music in the US at the time, actively censored music by black blues musicians due to them being overly sexual, despite allowing white musicians to perform basically the same stuff. And in the 60s and 70s, even when the FCC began loosening up censorship, a lot of radio stations and record stores would continue to self-censor for fear that companies would pull their sponsorships or advertisements if they heard them playing that music. So a white guy in a radio station would make the same decisions as the algorithm does today. The state didn't censor anymore, people now had free speech in regards to blues music, but the reality for many musicians didn't change anyway. It's just that the burden of censorship had shifted from a government bureaucrat to the platform the content was using. But let's talk about something that doesn't come from moral outrage, doesn't come from corporations wanting to protect their ad revenue, but comes from something cultural and that might actually make a lot of sense. Now I've been on the internet since 1998 when my village got broadband, so I've noticed a trend changing from this time. In the early days of the internet, in my experience at least, rules were less rigid, money was more speculative, and advertisers didn't give much of a shit of anything. And I noticed in early content creation, a lot of creators were allowed to be pretty human. But along comes the parasocial creator. A YouTuber who does not have that same level of disconnect from their own audience. You can watch a YouTuber and you think that they're on the same level as you. Take for example the concept of sexuality on YouTube. Many creators face a situation where fans will believe that they are befriending and sometimes falling in mutual love with the creators that they watch. So some creators, hopefully most, want to work against that sort of thing from happening. For more on parasocial relationships, please watch this masterpiece. And as a solution for this problem, a lot of content creators make either one of two choices. And they have a similar effect, I feel like. One is to distance themselves further and further from their own audience, to truly mark out that they are not someone that is approachable. You may like my content, but that doesn't mean you know me as a person. As I've gotten an audience, and as I've started to rely on that audience as a form of income, I don't talk about the same things that I used to. Which in some cases is good. I used to tweet some ignorant things back in the day. I've learned, thankfully, as most people I think have. But I used to post more about, like, my sex life, my dating life. Question that today might make people uncomfortable. Questions that if people asked me, might make me uncomfortable. Or they might tailor their persona to become practically asexual. Which, nothing wrong with that. Love asexuals, platonically, of course. But the end result of these strategies have become pretty much the same. Creators on the internet won't talk about sexuality for fear that it might trigger some of their fans into wanting to become sexual with them, which can of course lead to scandal. There are of course exceptions to this and this is not a hard and fast line between will never talk about sex and talks about sex all the time. It is very, it's a, spec it's a spectrum, but I think that this is kind of what has happened. A lot of people on the internet, unless they are explicitly sexual, will want to not be sexual ever. To be fair, having an online persona that is different from your own is a good thing. I don't act like this in real life. But another consequence of this that I have noticed is that when people actually are sexual, they're expected to be entirely sexual. Or rather, the people who are allowed to be sexual are, ostensibly, sex workers. And again, nothing wrong with sex workers. Love sex workers, friends with many of them. And some friends of mine who are sex workers tell me about the idea that they can talk about sexual topics, but because they are the only ones who are allowed to be sexual, they're not allowed to be basically anything else. Basically, a segregation between family friendly and the others. This is something that a lot of conservatives notice and want to exploit. 
They want to make this division stronger because in their mind, they want to protect family values. But what can happen is that a lot of subjects that are not sexual in and of themselves can become sexual. People will sexualize trans kids. People will sexualize young LGBT people. People will sexualize rock and roll. I mean, just look at how they describe a drag queen story hour. And this, I believe, has severe consequences. Obviously, talking about redacted isn't maybe not the most productive or important conversation to have on the internet right now. But I think that being able to talk about trans kids or gay people or any other potential future subject that might not be family friendly should still be allowed to be had and should also be allowed to be had on the level of other discussions too. But that's never gonna happen because as always, capitalism is the greatest enemy that will never die. And the big corporations that own the platforms where these conversations take place will never ever take a moment to rescind even a tiny bit of their ad revenue in order to have a freer, more open conversation. Which brings me to, is this a free speech issue? A common argument that I've heard especially when conservatives talk about being censored on YouTube and Twitter, is that it's not actually censorship and it's not a free speech issue. Free speech protects you from the government and that's it. A private corporation, surely, does not have any influence over free speech. It's not a free speech problem. But it is some kind of problem. A couple of years ago, YouTube, the company on which I run my platform, was discovered basically censoring a bunch of different words. A lot of LGBT creators suspected that YouTube might be unfairly judging their content, demonetizing their content, and also restricting its spread over the internet. This is something that YouTube and Google constantly disavowed and said was not happening, and there were no choice to actually restrict that type of content from the internet. They were lying. Or rather, maybe not technically lying, but rather lying by omission. YouTube, much like TikTok, runs on an algorithm. And that algorithm is programmed by people, and people's biases have a tendency to seep in. The wonderful people over at Nerd City made a video called YouTube's Biggest Lie, where they systematically go through a lot of words that people allege are being censored. And their analysis showed that LGBT phrasing are disproportionately demonetized from other type of content. They would do these tests by having basically identical videos and having identical titles, but replacing the word occasionally. So we could be gay wedding 2012 and happy wedding 2012. Same video, everything else completely identical but a video called happy would be fine, a video called gay would not. It's a wonderful video and I suggest that you watch it yourself. Now you may ask, is this a free speech issue still? A court has said, no, probably not. It is a private company. Its algorithm can do basically whatever it wants. But it is some type of issue. Now the consequences for YouTube for doing this type of restrictions were nada. It became a big drama thing a couple of years ago, but the conspiracy bug in my brain tells me that there's a reason for why almost no one is talking about it anymore. Because as far as I can tell, these restrictions still exist. The idea of free speech is that in a public space, you cannot be restricted from having your say. But what does public mean in the age of the internet? If you had the right of free speech, but corporations had a right to censor you, where do you have your speech? Where can you express yourself? In the olden times, that could be fairly easy. If you owned some land, you could do whatever you wanted on that land. If there were a public space, you could do that on that space. But what if every single space is owned by massive corporations? What if every single house is also owned by massive corporations. I, ostensibly, live on YouTube. I can do whatever I want here. I, ostensibly, have my speech on YouTube. 
I can say whatever I want here. That's not a free speech issue, I get it. And I do agree that maybe I shouldn't be allowed to make YouTube into a porn site if I wanted to. Free speech, I love free speech, but maybe I shouldn't be allowed to just like take over a website with porn. But let's say that YouTube wanted to restrict trans people, just generally, or gay people, generally, or women. Do they have a right to do that? Well, that's what brings us back to TikTok. Hi, and welcome to the only place where we're free to speak our minds. The wilderness, a pure place where we are free from censorship and the man. All of this is interesting because while moral laws aren't implemented as much today as it used to be, at least in some parts of the world, they still exist in practicality because of the family-friendly algorithm. And all that makes it so creators are incentivized to not talk about these things out of their own self-interest. Think of it like a bribe. Early censors we just outright ban you from doing anything. But also, if you're banned from doing anything on the platform, you may as well continue saying the things you wanted to say all along, just somewhere else. But on TikTok and YouTube, it's different. Because you get to stay on the platform, and you get to build a career, ingratiate yourself on the algorithm. As long as you say the right things. If you say something wrong, they might take away your livelihood. This all means that young people, the people who primarily use TikTok, and people who maybe use TikTok as their primary source of interaction with the world aren't being exposed to the same ideas and expressions that maybe they should be. Because those expressions aren't family friendly. Especially when people try to be explicit about those subjects. People can talk about the dollar being experience all they want. But if you want to talk about specific legislation in the US that bans LGBT content from schools, you need to use certain words that the algorithm is gonna know are controversial. And controversial is bad. And I've noticed this happening with a lot of creators who want to talk about kind of serious topics in their content, but feel like they're not allowed to for fear that it might impact their bottom line. Their livelihood is so ingrained into the platforms of YouTube or TikTok that if they do anything that might anger those platforms, even if it's not in violation of terms of service, just something that the algorithm might inadvertently pick up, that could be enough to sink content entirely, leading to something called shadow banning. And this impacts all creators. If you're a... What if I can hear something? Something's humping me. If you're a small creator, a hit like that can completely tank your channel. Something that I kind of suspect happened to me back when I made my first video on Redacted. But if you're a big creator, I mean, having just a 5% impact on view count on your channel can also have significant effects. Now, my video on Redacted maybe wasn't the grand magnum opus that maybe it should have been. But I'm not the only person who have had a video like that been demonetized and age restricted. And the end result is that a lot of people on the platform will take away the lesson that, okay, I guess we never talk about redacted. And if you never talk about redacted, how do you talk about it responsibly? The message to a lot of people is clear. You don't. Or in my case, <laughs> you replace every single word with a word to drink instead. <laughs> and the overall effect of this is of course that the amount of videos on the topic is going to go down. And this encourages people to talk about things like serotonin rocks instead. And while this circumvents the algorithm and the problems therein, it also devalues the conversation. No one can really have a serious conversation about a thing like that. Some, some kids in the forest. <laughs> Now this doesn't just happen when the algorithm suppresses your content or being demonetized for a certain type of content. Sometimes it can just happen with terms of service being weirdly enforced. A lot of creators, especially black and LGBT creators on TikTok, 
have noticed that they feel that the enforcement of rule violations are very different. For example, blatantly white nationalist propaganda is sometimes not removed, whereas footage from Black Lives Matter protests or content that is promoting Black Lives Matter events or awareness or anything are sometimes taken down for God knows what reason. It's not like these companies are very transparent in the way that they operate. And even advice to how to get into the algorithm is different depending on whether or not you're gay or intersex or black compared to anyone else. It feels like for many creators, although not all, that the algorithm is stacked against them, that they will be banned or shadow banned simply for... Yeah. Now I've mentioned shadow banning a few times, so let's talk about what that actually is. Shadow banning is a phenomenon where a platform will ban a user, but without it being obvious to the user that they have been banned. There's no like, big pop-up saying you have been banned from participating. Rather, you might still be able to post, interact with other users, do everything that you are supposed to be able to do, but other users might not actually be able to see what you do. So you post into nothingness. No one reads it, no one can understand it, no one receives it. Instead, you think that you're fine. This can also take the form of heavily suppressing your content. So the YouTube equivalent would be that the YouTube algorithm just does not pick up on your videos anymore. They don't recommend you to other users, they might not even show you in the subscription page of users who are subscribed to you. But people can still find you as long as they specifically search for exactly you. But that's not how algorithms are supposed to work. Now I have a conspiracy theory that this is what happened to me when I made my first video on Redacted. That video allegedly encouraged Redacted. use, which is against terms of service. And even though I complained, and even though it was found to not be against their community guidelines or whatever, it still kind of sunk my channel for a little bit. I noticed that my growth slowed down. I noticed that a lot of my subscribers didn't get my videos in their subscription feeds. So I think that's what happened to me. But I guess I'll never know uh, because YouTube and other tech companies will never reveal how they work and transparency is only a word to them. According to tech historian Mar Higgs, a lot of creators on TikTok feel overly cautious about what they are allowed to say on the platform, feeling that if they say anything out of line, they might get banned or get their content restricted on the platform. This lack of transparency goes as far as to people not knowing whether or not the moderation is automated or not. Is there a person behind the scenes banning people intentionally or is this just an algorithm misfiring? Not to mention that the rules <laughs> change all the time. Now, none of this is to even go into the actual censorship that goes into these platforms, primarily TikTok. YouTube knows that they can kind of get away with saying that, well, we don't intentionally ban any gay people from the platform, which might technically be true, but doesn't help a lot of the LGBT people that are, in fact, shadow banned. But TikTok is special. If you didn't know, TikTok is originally Chinese, merging with musical.ly in 2018. It is still, though, primarily headed by Chinese interests, by which, of course, I mean the Chinese Communist Party. The app, on top of being a content creation platform, also weirdly has a lot of beautiful people on the front page or the For You page. When you scroll on TikTok, most of the people you find are very beautiful. And I mentioned this in my video on beauty not too long ago. But here's the thing, in 2020, moderators on TikTok were ordered to remove people who they saw as too ugly or poor or disabled. Like TikTok was only for the really beautiful people. Also in 2020, the Wall Street Journal discovered that a lot of TikTokers were posting pro-Beijing content as a way to tap into the algorithm, discovering that by being pro-China and pro-Beijing, they got more viewers. Also in 2020, a former executive of TikTok told a British inquiry into TikTok that they do ban people who are critical of Beijing. Okay, back to the list. 
In 2021, Russian officials actually thanked TikTok for helping to suppress footage around protests against Putin. And as late as last year, any reference to re-education camp were replaced with asterisks instead in basically every caption. This presents an interesting phenomenon where TikTokers will be aware that their content can be removed for being too political, being too serious, and being too critical of China or basically anything that isn't consumer friendly. And I think what's insidious here is that a lot of TikTokers know this. They know that they can't say anything that goes against both the interests of advertisers, but also not the interests of the platform itself. And while this is the symptoms of a dystopic nightmare, it doesn't feel like it is because TikTok is happy. It's a nice place. Le dollar bean. This language adaptation makes a lot of people feel like they're in control. They're one-upping the algorithm. You can't trick me, big TikTok. I have beaten your system. Fact is that more often than not, TikTok doesn't actually care. They're happy that you're not using actual words to describe the things that you actually want to talk about. It becomes unserious sounds like nonsense and when you actually want to criticize the power structures at hand you're not even allowed to adapt that language now a lot of people see tiktok as harmless fun and not really a platform to do serious content creation on some people will say that you should turn to old media for that or at the very least youtube where you can be a bit more serious but why should we though and this is what brings me back to YouTube, because YouTube, as far as I know, hasn't changed its policy on LGBT content. When I talk to LGBT creators today, a lot of them still feel, like four years down the line, that nothing has changed. That there's the same arbitrary rule enforcement, the same demonetization policy, the same shadow banning still in effect. I fully think that this is still what's happening, and I know that YouTube and TikTok are in on it, and I know... <laughs> that it's completely redacted and i know that tiktok is in on it and i know redacted. Redacted. redacted why did the story completely disappear in 2018 why have no one talked about it ever since then i believe youtube redacted um for the sake of slander i do want to say that this is all opinion like this entire video it's just my opinion man yeah well you know that's just like uh your opinion man a lot of young people not all, but a lot of young people do use TikTok as their primary way to interact with the outside world. A lot of people have made good educational content on TikTok. A lot of people use TikTok to do good things. The problem here isn't ability to have those serious discussions on the platform. It's permission to have it. Ah, I'm gonna bring out my little bear hair. This is my um, reality check bear. <laughs> so obviously I've talked a lot about, uh, <laughs> you okay there buddy? So obviously I've talked a lot about how this impacts YouTubers or online discussions where YouTubers exist or people on TikTok. But this is a scenario that doesn't just affect like modern new media in, if, if I can use that sort of language. It also impacts old media. The idea of online self-censorship is something that people will sometimes spot, but will have a hard time labeling as such. Think about, for example, when the billionaire and neo-feudal overlord Jeff Bezos bought the Washington Post a couple of years ago. People on Twitter will occasionally make fun of the people who write on the Washington Post for not criticizing billionaires enough, or occasionally just praising them. But a factor of why that might be happening is probably not outright censorship, I doubt that Jeff Bezos would come into the company and just be like, no one is allowed to criticize me here anymore, lest I will have your head. But what can happen is that a lot of journalists will simply not write about billionaires anymore, knowing that they might face some type of retribution down the line, or potentially just be passed over for promotion occasionally, or might not get the juiciest stories because they make a fuss criticizing the owner over and over again, you know, it's gonna give you a bad rap. P. 
people might not like it. And what happens is a form of self-selection. People who are glad to promote billionaires stay on. People who criticize, they leave. This can also happen on places like TikTok and YouTube. People who are so fed up with the algorithm that they leave. People who are good at the algorithm, people who are using it, people who might even be in favor of it, they stay. So the algorithm becomes stronger. Which means that for journalists and everyone basically who has any type of power or platform, they choose to create an altered perception of themselves to display to the world. One that is more marketable, more likable, more family friendly. Which again, in some cases is a good thing. I don't think YouTubers should be themselves <laughs> too much because that will invite parasocial relationship bullshit. But if everyone deals with those types of issues in the same way, by becoming a caricature of a good worker, supportive of capitalism, yes, <laughs> that means that what's gonna end up happening is that everyone will look the same, everyone will speak the same, and speaking truth to actual power becomes controversial and becomes harder and harder and harder. And this type of self-censorship also shows itself in schools. In a lot of countries, even here in progressive Sweden, occasionally teachers will not educate children on subjects like homosexuality, bisexuality, trans people, asexuality, the idea of being nice to immigrants, <laughs> talking about the concept of war, occasionally even mentioning the existence of the Holocaust, for fear of offending parents, or for fear that children aren't mature enough to handle that type of content. And so this sort of self-censorship here on YouTube might seem inconsequential, but I've gotten a number of emails from people who told me that they never heard of trans people existing in school, never learned anything about trans history, never knew that it was even a thing, until they discovered my videos on YouTube. When schools and media self-censor their own output of knowledge, a lot of people will turn to TikTok and YouTube and online spaces for that information as well. And the fact that those spaces too are contributing to a form of self-censorship is I think dangerous, which means that critical sources of information just aren't available to many people. And instead of learning in an open, respectful manner about the effects of very important subjects such as sex, drugs, and rock and roll, they'll have to go to places where it might not be as safe. Instead of learning openly about the drugs, they have to learn about serotonin rocks on TikTok. Now, I obviously want to counter the narrative of this. I want to be a bit more open about more controversial subjects, which is why I made my video on drinks the other month. And uh, which also brings me to the sponsor of this video, which is Adam and Eve. They make sex toys. Adam and Eve has 24 seven customer support and they have a 90 day return policy. So if you don't like what you get, like if it's too big or too small or whatever, I don't, <laughs> Whatever, whatever, whatever doesn't fit up your alley, uh, <laughs> you can return it. 20% of their profits also go to prevent the spread of HIV throughout the world. Uh, and I think that that's pretty good. So go and uh, flick your bean. What do people say in English when about masturbation? Using the code in my description, you get a 50% discount on one item and free shipping in the US and Canada. Some uh, exceptions do apply. I, you'll have to take that with, up with them, but it's a good deal. They also do discreet shipping in case you want to hide your shame. Um, I wish they had an option for like flamboyant shipping so that like when I pick up my mail from the grocery store, uh, there's it, it announces its presence like, hello, I'm going to make you come. <laughs> hello, I'm here to make you come. Use the code in my description at checkout to receive your discount and also uh, to make you come. Thank you for watching that video. Uh, this video is a bit shorter and a bit more 
uh, loosey goosey than the videos that I usually do. Um, this is because I'm I'm working on a, I'm working on a big big thing for for April May. Uh, that's gonna be it's gonna be fun. Um, can't talk about all of that yet. But what I can talk about is uh, I have a PO box now. Uh, information should be on the screen if you wanna if 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 you if you like this video and you wanna send me some some fun stuff uh, if you, if you would like you can do that there. I also want to mention that I do a podcast that I haven't mentioned here uh, a lot, but I, I do a medical history podcast that I think is pretty good. It's called Leech Fest. Um, I, th I think you should give that a listen too, <laughs> giving that a little shout out as well. If you like this video, please consider uh, giving it a like, a comment, uh, hitting the bell, all of that stuff. It really does help the channel. Um, and it just makes me happy to see that you're out there. And I especially want to thank all of my patrons who make this financially sustainable for me to do. And if you want to be one of those, please consider supporting me on Patreon. And with all of that said, I want to give a special shout out to Aislin, Elisa Crawford, Amanda B, Amara, Amelia Unchained, Amy Lee, Andy Sophia Fontaine, Angelo Garcia, Ashley K, Aster Disaster, Athiet, Austin K, Autumn, Batgirl Allison, Caleb Webb, Catherine Stenson, Chad Horton, Chloe Dollar, Christine Gutierrez, Cobra Sphere, Dana Ferguson, D. Mirandi Araceto, Eleanor Cassidy, Emil Rutkowski, Emilia Clark, Emily Pinkies, Erich Owens, Fox Kant, Henry R. Seymour, Jane Lesby, Janelle Torgeson, Jared Arnold, Jay Parker, Jane the Human, Jill Isabel Meyer, Jurgen, Joshua Analik, Julie Helene, LPQ Silver, Leonard Shavaz, Madison Jacob, Maeve Westall, Marcus Smith, Mary Neckar, Maurizio, Mia, Michaela, Mo Khalifa, Maud Siro, Nicholas Kapoor, Njofbun, OPB, Powell Dubeck, Remy, Rose Brandon, Rose H, Sean, No More No Less, Sitzries, Sonic Bread, Stephanie Sterling, Thea Vega, Thoris of Mir, Tulips, William Fuhussel, Wawa Warm Goose, Violet Tosukas Harrison, Vivian Crow, and Wolfgang, the Grand High Exalted Wizard. Thank you.